In the previous lesson, uh, we looked at the process view of operations and we looked at different types of processes. Now we will start talking about how we can go about analyzing these particular processes. So let's start out with a simple example. Let's look at this car wash. And in this particular car wash, we have cars coming in from one end and cars coming out, and we are standing out and watching the cars as they leave. And what we notice is that there's a car that seems to be leaving every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes a car leaves, which means that in an hour there are about six cars that are leaving this car wash. Now, the 10 minute time, the gap in between one car leaving and the next car leaving, we will call the cycle time. If we look at the number of cars leaving per unit time, in this case an hour, we will call it the flow rate. So the flow rate for our particular car wash is six per hour versus the cycle time for our uh, car wash is 10 minutes. Now, let's see what happens when we look at a particular car, as we are watching these cars, we have all these gray colored cars, dusty and all coming in, and they come out nice and shiny green on the other end. But suddenly, we see this new car, and this new car is uh, a brown color. And we say, oh, wait a minute, let's see what happens to this car. So we wait to see what happens to this car, what color it is when it comes out, and we wait 10 minutes later, there's still a green car coming out. And we wait for some time and it, we find out that it takes 25 minutes for this car to come out. So even though there's a car coming out every 10 minutes, when our car goes in, our brown car, and comes out as a shiny red car at the other end, it took it 25 minutes to go through the car wash to eventually come out. This 25 minutes, we will call the flow time or the throughput time. Notice that the throughput time or flow time, which is 25 minutes, is different than our cycle time, which was 10 minutes. So even though a car is coming out every 10 minutes, a specific car going into the car wash will take 25 minutes to come out. So we've now defined a cycle time, we've defined a flow rate, so the cycle time was the time between two consecutive units departing the process. And the flow rate was the rate at which units are departing the system. Notice that the flow rate is always going to be equal to one divided by the cycle time. We also defined the flow time or throughput time. And this is the time it takes a flow unit to go through the entire process. Now, if we were to look at this 25 minutes that it took for the car to go through, we might want to know what was going on for 25 minutes. So let's see what happens inside this car wash. We have a pre-rinse area, we have a scrubbing area, we have a rinse, we have a wax, and then we have a dry. While the car is going through this process, the driver has to get out, and the driver has to sign a waiver so that any damage to the car is not the responsibility of the car wash people. And then he goes, the driver goes and has a cup of coffee. Then they go and pay. But all of that requires only 11 minutes. And so then they have to wait. So now we have a car comes in and it breaks up into two parallel activities. In one activity, the car is actually going through the wash. In the other case, the driver is going through some steps before the two join together and they leave. Now, in this particular case, when we have to calculate the flow time, even though there's a lot of activities that are going on, some of these activities are in parallel, and so to find the flow time, we look for the longest path of any of the split units that we have. So in this particular case, the longest path still remains 25 minutes, uh, even though we had the driver uh, have to get out and do some extra activities, but they were being done while the car was being washed, and so there is no difference in the flow time. So what happens now if we start thinking in terms of the same definitions of flow time, flow rate, and throughput time, if instead of looking at it from the entire process, if we start looking at it for each individual activity inside the process. 
Now remember that as, as a process, we can think of any subset of these activities as long as they are contiguous one after the other. And we could think of that as a sub-process and then study it as a process. And so anything that we've said about the entire process would apply to the sub-process. And since a single activity is a special case of a, of, of the, of a sub-process, anything that we've said for the entire process also applies for the activity. So for an individual activity, the cycle time is simply the processing time for that activity. Similarly, the flow rate is one over the processing time or one over the cycle time for that activity. So the definitions carry over when we look at it in, from an activity point of view. Now, what happens if you have more than one station which does the same activity? So for example, in our uh, car wash, we had a drying station. And the drying station was taking quite a bit of time. It was taking 10 minutes. What if we decide to have two drying stations? Now things are a little different because in the 10 minutes that it takes to dry the car, since there are two people working on two cars at the same time, we could have two cars coming out at the end of 10 minutes. Accordingly, our flow rate is going to be double so that instead of having six cars come out of this station, we are going to have 12 cars coming out of this station. So I can think in terms of, for this particular activity, I can think in terms of a cycle time of five minutes because it's, for every 10 minutes I get two cars, and so that's five minutes. And if I look at the flow rate, that's one over the cycle time, so that becomes one over five, which is 0 0.2 cars per minute. So in general, when we think of cycle time of an activity is the processing time divided by the number of stations. And if I think of the flow rate, it would be one over the cycle time. The flow time of the activity, however, doesn't change. The flow time is still 10 minutes because any single car coming into this activity, when it leaves the activity, will still take 10 minutes to go out. So the flow time doesn't change, but the flow rate does change and the cycle time changes. A very special case of multiple stations is when we think of batch processing. So suppose we were, we had to bake 50 cookies and we have to bake 50 cookies at a time in the oven for 20 minutes. Not being a cook, I'm not sure whether 20 minutes is too long or too short. I might end up burning them to a crisp, but suppose that happens. So I have 50 cookies in 20 minutes. So if I now want to think in terms of the cycle times, I have 20 minutes in that 20 minutes, I get 50 cookies, so 20 divided by 50 is 0 0.4 minutes per cookie. And the flow rate then is the reciprocal of the cycle time, which is 1 over 0 0.4, or I'm getting 2.5 cookies per minute. Once we have looked at all the activities, what we will notice is that certain activities have larger cycle times than other activities. Or, in other words, they may have smaller flow rates than other activities. The activity which has the smallest flow rate is called the bottleneck activity. Similarly, if it has the longest cycle time, we'll call it a bottleneck activity. And since they are reciprocals of each other, it always means the same thing. Now, it's possible that there are multiple such activities in our process which have the largest uh, time, and in which case, all of them will be called bottleneck activities. Let's take an example. Uh, in this example, job applicants are coming for a warehouse position and they have to undergo a medical examination as shown in the figure. There are several different steps in this medical examination. In fact, there are eight steps, starting with a check-in, then they go on and give a uh, fluid sample. The fluid sample is sent for testing, the applicant uh, himself or herself has to then go on and be physically evaluated. Then they go and see a physician, at which point the physician has all the evaluation of the applicant as well as of the fluid samples. And then they finally go and see the HR specialist to uh, find out if they've actually passed the medical examination. So if I look at each step, each step has a certain amount of time that it takes for a flow unit, in this case an applicant, to complete that particular step. And there may be multiple stations for that step. So check-in takes 12 minutes for an applicant, 
but there are three check-in stations. The next step, which is giving the sample, takes a smaller amount of time, eight minutes, but there are two stations at this particular location. So given such a system, let's go ahead and figure out what our performance metrics are. We'll start out by looking at each activity and figuring out what the activity metrics are. So if you look at the figure, you will see that we have the processing times for each of the activities and we have the number of parallel stations for that activity. So M represents those number of parallel stations. Now we can calculate for each one of them the flow rate and cycle time. Let's take station one. For station one, there are three parallel stations and it takes 12 minutes of processing time. So the flow rate is M divided by PT, which is three divided by 12 or 0 0.25. Since the cycle time is the reciprocal of the flow rate, the reciprocal of one over 0.25 happens to be four and so that's the cycle time. We can similarly calculate activity two, activity three, etc., and we can calculate their flow rates and cycle times. Notice that activities five and seven have a cycle time of 10 minutes each. They have a flow rate correspondingly of 0 0.1. So they have the slowest flow rate and the largest cycle time. So activities five and seven we will call our bottleneck activities. Once we've identified our bottleneck, it's very easy to figure out what the process metrics are. So we have the activity metrics, we now can figure out what the process metrics are. The bottleneck activities we said were activities five and seven, and so the process cycle time is the same as the cycle time of the bottleneck activity. And so the process cycle time in this case then is 10 minutes, and the process flow rate is one over 10 applicants per minute. What's the flow time for this particular operation? So if you look at this particular process as a whole, we can look for the longest path through this process. So if you look at activities one, two, three, four, seven, and eight, then if you add up the processing times of those activities, we get 65 minutes. That is the longest path through this particular process, and so the flow time for this particular process is 65 minutes. This says that an applicant who enters the process will take 65 minutes to complete this particular process. This is an easy way for us to now analyze any operation to figure out the rate at which the process produces a product or produces service, and the time it's going to take for a flow unit to go through the entire process. So by dividing it into activities, by studying each activity individually, and then looking at bottleneck activities, we are now able to figure out how much time it will take uh, to run this uh, particular process.